Well, congratulations. We've landed once again over three years on the fabulous divorce reading that I can never hear read out loud in the context of our world and our life when so many of us have been touched by divorce and just let it be without talking about it because it seems pretty harsh, right? If you take Jesus' words at face value, there's a lot of sin going on in this room, right? This is um, something that has touched nearly, nearly all of us, one way or another. Um, but my late husband was a divorced man when I married him, so there's that. Um, there are people in this room who have had long and happy marriages to the first person they ever married, and that was wonderful. We don't know how many times that marriage came close to breaking up. We don't know if it was easy or if they worked really hard or what happened. The only two people that really know what is going on in a marriage, of course, is are the two people that are in it. And even they probably have two different ideas about what is going on in that marriage. So um, I think it's important to look at this um, and, and just think about what is Jesus really saying. Because um, these words have been used by the church, especially, to exclude people, to stigmatize people, to keep people away from the church. I know people who, whose parents were divorced and saw what the church did to one or both of the parents and has sworn out church because of that. I have seen um, ways that this has been used hopefully not as much now, but probably still, to encourage women to stay in abusive marriages where they might be hurt. I mean, there are just, these are words that have not really been helpful to a lot of people. So, um, I think we need to just to think about them. And especially in this case, when it's Jesus himself, you know, there are certain um, words that are, are known as clobber texts that people pull out and say it's wrong to be gay and you can look at it because of this word in the Bible. Um, and I think there's ways to think about those too. But in this case, as opposed to any of those, this is Jesus talking. You know, so we need to do something with that. It is also true, I want to say, that the church has figured out ways to relax some of that, right? And even the Roman Catholic Church has ways to include people in the church. There's a process you can go through, and you know, it is what it is, but it has become more and more possible for people to uh, not have to live with a really bad decision, or not to have to live with a really bad situation, and still be able to go on and find happiness in another relationship. Thank God. So, I want to point out, for instance, last week's gospel, and I've said this before, but I wasn't here last week, it says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better to enter life maimed than have two hands and go to hell. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. That's what Jesus said, right? If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, get the little glory. And the fact is that even people who want to take the Bible literally are not following those instructions, right? If, if we were, none of us would still have two hands, or two feet, or two eyes, I would venture to say. Um, so we know that sometimes we take what Jesus says at face value, and sometimes we don't. So the question is, how do you figure out? And, and it's convenient to say, well, I don't really agree with that, or I don't like that, so Jesus didn't really mean it, <laughs> right? Or, or I really like what Jesus says here, I'm sure he meant that. So you need to step, step back and just kind of say, how do you figure it out? How can you with integrity figure out what God wants for us in this world? Um, so to me, well, for instance, Matthew 25, that's when Jesus tells the story about the, the king coming at the end of days and saying to the, separating the sheep and the goats and saying, when you 
when you saw me naked and you clothed me, when you saw me hungry, or when you saw others hungry and you fed them, you know, and they said, well, when did we see you? And he says, if you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. I like that one a lot. I think that's important for us to pay attention to. Well, okay. Um, when the Bible says, care for the stranger in your midst. To me, that's really important. That when people come into our lives, into our country, into the world, that the Bible says we're supposed to care for one another. Um, okay? Um, when Jesus says, love one another, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that's not easy, but it makes a lot of sense to me. I want to do that. Um, this one, not so much. So, first I want to say that the filter, I think, that we use to figure out what the Bible says and what it means for us in our lives today, that the, the first filter is to know that, that God is love and that God said love your neighbor as yourself and that love does not harm the neighbor. So if we interpret something and we know that it's going to do a lot of harm to someone, then we have to say, okay, it can't be quite what it means. We need to sit back and figure this out. I can't take it at face value if what it means is that my sister is going to be harmed or my brother is going to be harmed, either by remaining in a, in a marriage that's very bad for the person or by saying you're, you don't have a right to have um, another happy marriage after a broken marriage, I, I think that is harming a person. So I want to say, okay, that's one test. That can't be what it is. Another is to look at the context and to say, why did Jesus say this? What was he, what was behind it? And you notice that Jesus didn't like get up that morning and say, Okay, today I'm going to preach about marriage, <laughs> or today I'm going to preach about divorce. It's because he was asked a question. And the question was designed to trip him up, right? It was not just the like, I'm really curious, what do you think? It was, it was adversarial. So he is asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Notice, they don't ask, is it lawful for a woman to divorce her husband? Because men had a lot more power in that time. Maybe they still do, I don't know. But um, certainly, that was a patriarchal system. Um, anyway, they asked him that, and he says, well, what does the law say? And in fact, there are provisions in the law of Moses for divorce. And there are reasons. It's open to interpretation, as many things are. But divorce happens. It wasn't unheard of at all, especially in the society around them. Um, and so Jesus, Jesus says, well, what does the law say? And they say, I'm going to read this part. Um, um, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal to divorce her. OK, you notice again, that's the man with the power. and. The woman who has less or little power, and when she is left, she's in a, often in a hard place. Not unlike this can happen today, right? So um, when Jesus answers this, I think they want him to spell out what are the circumstances, what are the rules, what are what is it, and what he wants to say is actually. God's intention is for marriage to be forever. God's intention is for marriage to be for peace and for uh, a couple to live together and be together as long as they live. And I just wanted to interject one thing that's very different about our world now, and that is that in this time, life expectancy was very different. It was 40 or 50 years was the average that you might expect to live. And men often waited until they were about 30 to marry. So we're talking about a marriage that might last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 75. I know people who have gotten to 75 years of marriage, right? It's a very different kind of thing. 
So just to name that. Um, but also to say what Jesus is saying is this is God's intention. This is, this is what is the best for a relationship. This is what God wants. I mean, God wants us to love one another, to figure out how to be together, to figure out how to take care of one another, how to work through issues. But the fact is that doesn't always happen. And sometimes one person is left uh, without a way to make it better if the other person doesn't want to, right? Um, there, there are many nuances in it. And also sometimes people just make mistakes. And God doesn't want us to be condemned for all eternity because we made a mistake. I think there is grace in what we do. God's intention is a faithful forever covenant between two people. But we know that doesn't always happen. We make mistakes, we make bad decisions, we find ourselves in an untenable situation, and sometimes divorce is the holy option. Sometimes that is what we need to do. And even when it isn't, there's grace on the other side. So I can't believe that what Jesus is saying is that, you know, too bad for you if you chose wrong the first time. We know that there are ways to come through and to come into a new relationship and to take what you learned from the first one and make the new one better and continue to ask asking God to help you. Um, and this is true not just for marriage, of course. This is true for all relationships, for relationships we have with our kids and our parents and our siblings and our community and our friends. And God's intention is for them to be whole and to be healed. Someone told me this morning that she is praying for uh, preparation of her best friend, that, that they have a falling out, and she is so bereft to have lost this friendship, and she is doing what she can to try and restore it. It is, it is part of being human. It is who we are and what we do. Um, when Jesus met the woman at the well, he didn't say, ha, ah, I perceive you have been married many, many times, and I think maybe you've broken your marriage vows, and I can't talk to you anymore, I'm sorry. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He, in fact, has a wonderful theological discussion with her, and he raises her up, and he confesses to her first that he is the Messiah. When he, uh, the woman is caught in adultery and the crowd wants to stone her, Jesus stops that. Right? He lifts, lifts her up. He says, whoever was without sin cast the first stone. And of course, they all had to put their stones down. Jesus was not in the business of excluding people. And we can't be either. We uh, believe in new chances. We believe in a God who persistently and consistently loves us. We had our Blessing of the Animal service yesterday in honor of St. Francis, and there's a little part of it that reminds us of the unconditional love of our animals that can remind us of God's unconditional love for us. Because that's who God is. Wherever we are, whatever we've done, God keeps loving. God keeps hoping. God keeps rooting for us. So it's up to us to strive to love one another as God intended. And may it be so. Amen.